What are the biggest what if questions in WWE over the last 15 years? Well, I can think of three off the bat. What if CM Punk stayed in the company instead of leaving in 2014? What if John Cena turned heel on the fans? And what if WWE gave Bray Wyatt all the creative freedom needed to become the big star he truly can be? You see, Wyatt has proven to be one of the most creative superstars in WWE history. The Firefly Funhouse match, a match essentially created by Bray from scratch, is one of the most innovative matches in WWE history. The characters he's created, the stories he's teased, and the brilliant mind on display by Wyatt has proven to capture the minds of wrestling fans all around the world. Yet time and time again, Wyatt's momentum would be halted as the so-called creative team of WWE has repeatedly cut the legs out from underneath him every chance they can. For a man with all the talent in the world, Bray's become a victim of WWE's creative struggles over the last decade. But how did everything go so wrong for him? How did Bray Wyatt become one of the biggest drop balls in recent history? Well, my name is Grisha from Wrestleology, and let us dive into it as we talk about Bray Wyatt's disappointing time in WWE. So before we can actually talk about Bray Wyatt, we have to talk about another figure from Bray's past. A figure so menacing, so destructive, and so impactful to the wrestling business that even just stating his name brings fear into the hearts of every WWE superstar, and that man is Husky Harris. That was all sarcasm, by the way, but back in the early days of NXT, Husky Harris competed to earn himself a shot at a WWE contract. He, along with many others, failed in this venture. However, that didn't stop him from trying to take on the WWE roster by force. So, alongside notable stars like Daniel Bryan, Justin Gabriel, and, of course, Wade Barrett, he would debut on the main roster as a member of Nexus. But despite this debuting alongside this White Hawk group, Husky would soon be phased out of the group and sent back down to the developmental show FC w to reinvent himself but this trip back down to florida became a huge blessing in disguise for husky as he would debut a new character soon after named bray wyatt an ominous cult leader character bray wyatt instantly got the attention of fans with his unique character captivating everyone that was watching soon this cult leader would also find himself some followers of course as luke harper and eric rowan joined him to form the new iconic faction the wyatt family and despite not picking up too many wins on the newly rebranded nxt bray's family of backwoods Destroyer still caught the attention of many higher-ups in WWE, and in May 2013, the WWE Universe would catch their first glimpse of this group on the main roster with creepy vignettes making the arrival of Bray, Harper, and Rowan. And Bray wanted to mark himself as the newest top monster in WWE, so he targeted the demonic Kane as his first opponent. For weeks on end, Bray would have one message for Kane, follow the buzzards. This new catchphrase for Bray would take off across the WWE Universe, with fans curious as to what all this could mean and just who this new character was. Kane, meanwhile, only wanted to get rid of his Bray Wyatt problem. So, the two would battle in Bray's first ever match at SummerSlam in a Ring of Fire match. But despite the match underwhelming those in attendance, Bray was still able to get the job done against the Devil's favorite demon before his followers would eerily carry Kane off into the darkness. Bray then chose to target another member of the roster in Daniel Bryan. You see, while Kane may have been the biggest monster that Bray could defeat, Bryan was easily the most popular superstar in the company and Bray understood that. He became very interested in Bryan, looking to add him into the Wyatt family, and after weeks of torment, Bryan would finally be recruited into the family with Bray's dominance being put on display as a credible threat for the WWE roster. However, this partnership would only become a bad memory for Brian as Brian would soon embrace the WWE Universe and break free from the Wyatt family in one of the greatest moments of the entire year. Following a steel cage match, Brian and Bray were trapped inside the structure as Brian turned his back on the family to a chorus of screaming fans. However, despite this setback, Bray was still able to earn himself a victory over the future WWE Champion at the Royal Rumble pay-per-view. But how do you top a feud with the most over-wrestler in the entire company? Well, by going after three of the most over-wrestlers in the company right afterwards. Oh, and also kicking off a feud with the biggest WWE superstar of the last decade at the same time. Following his match with Bryan, John Cena was set to defend his WWE World Heavyweight title against Randy Orton, but to the shock of many, Cena was actually Actually targeted by Wyatt and this distraction helped Orton capture the gold. He would continue to attack Cena, even attacking a team featuring Cena, Sheamus, and Daniel Bryan that would give them a disqualification victory over the Shield. This, however, would have a very interesting side effect in that the Shield would start to target the Wyatt family and a feud between two of the hottest factions in the world would commence. 
and it would all culminate at that year's Elimination Chamber event a few weeks later in one of the most exciting three-on-three -three tag team matches in WWE's entire history. And after a grueling war, the Wyatt family would continue their winning ways by beating the Shield. Yes, for the first few months of his career, Bray Wyatt would be a dominating competitor as fan support would grow around him. So Bray decided to catapult that momentum into a high profile match with the biggest name in the company at the grandest stage of them all, WrestleMania 30, against John Cena. Wyatt would torment Cena for months, trying to break down Cena's character as this heroic figure in WWE. He called into question everything about Cena's time in WWE, as well as his position in the company. And for the first time in a very long time, Cena's Superman-like character would start to crack with Bray having a strong effect on Cena's psyche. And at WrestleMania, the two would finally come face to face. But as Bray looked to finally push Cena beyond his breaking point, John was able to fight back as he always does to get a victory over him. And this moment was what many people see as Bray's first real fumble as a character. Many fans say that this was the real turning point for Bray as he would have really benefited from a victory over Cena on the grandest stage of them all. And while this may have been a big loss for Bray, we will soon find that this loss was merely a paper cut when compared to the suffering he has gone through under the WWE umbrella. Sure, Bray lost to Cena, but Bray was in a high profile match with John Cena at WrestleMania in his first year on the main Main roster. That's a huge accomplishment, and while he may have lost this match, fans were still excited to see what Bray will do in the future. But the feud wouldn't stop there. No, this loss only proved to fuel Wyatt's anger towards Cena as the two would battle for the next few months. At Extreme Rules, the two would compete inside a steel cage with Bray picking up the victory following the interference of a creepy kid singing He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. The song following this match would become a staple to Bray's character as an ominous song that would signal the arrival of Bray's darkness. However, Cena would conclude the feud with this ominous figure of WWE by defeating Bray in a last man standing match at Payback. But Bray wouldn't be down for long. Despite losing the feud with John Cena, Bray still looked to make a name for himself in WWE. And even though he couldn't defeat the biggest name in the WWE, Bray would target another living legend in Chris Jericho. This time though, Bray actually found a lot more success than in his feud with Cena. Sure, the battles with Cena were perhaps more emotional, with Bray walking in with the intent of turning John against the fans, but Bray ended up winning this feud with Jericho. They had three matches, one at Battleground, which Jericho shockingly won with an out of nowhere code breaker. The next at SummerSlam had Bray picking up a dominating victory over Jericho. And then finally, everything came to a head inside yet another Steel Cage match. Looking back on it, the Steel Cage was definitely Wyatt's signature match during the early parts of his career. Either way, Bray got the win here after a series of brutal elbows to the back of Jericho's head before commemorating the moment with a sister Abigail to Chris after the match. In the weeks following this win, more vignettes would start playing surrounding the Wyatt family. However, this time, these vignettes would be more about Bray's disciples and Harper and Rowan. In these videos, we see Bray actually let Harper and Rowan free from their shackles in the Wyatt family. No, the Wyatt family didn't break up around this time with a huge war like so many other factions concluded with. This time, more appropriately for Bray's character, he simply just lets his disciples roam free on Raw and SmackDown to carve their own paths in WWE. But what about Bray? Where did he go from here now that he, in his words, fixed Harper and Rowan? Well, he decided to look for another fractured soul in WWE. And in the main event of Hell in a Cell, he got that answer in the form of Dean Ambrose. This, of course, was a Dean Ambrose who was embroiled in this blood war with his former shield mate, Seth Rollins, a feud that had consumed his entire existence following Seth's betrayal. So it's easy to see how Bray saw Dean as this broken character. And in theory, Bray looking to help Dean regain his sanity through destruction? That's a pretty fun idea. However, the execution of it was just so disappointing. It harmed both men in this feud, making Bray feel pointless and making Dean feel a little bit like an idiot. At Survivor Series, Bray got in the head of Ambrose and used that manipulation to earn a disqualification victory. They would compete again at TLC the following month in a tables, ladders, and chairs match, and for most of the match, everything seems fine. Standard TLC action, and then the finish came, which just left many fans confused and frustrated. Ambrose went out and retrieved a TV monitor, but it just exploded, blinding Ambrose. Wyatt took advantage and used it to steal the victory. A few weeks later, 
Wyatt would ultimately defeat his rival once and for all in an ambulance match on Raw after slamming him into the vehicle. So, despite losing his Wyatt family faction, Bray was still able to stand on his own in a war with WWE. And in the months following this, Bray would give himself the title of the new face of fear. He proclaimed that with this new nickname, he was the most dominant figure in WWE with a series of cryptic promos leading up to WrestleMania. And to cement himself with the title, Bray would kick off a feud with The Undertaker. And leading into Mania, many fans were intrigued by this match on multiple levels. The year prior, the streak had been broken and Taker walked out of that match looking very worse for wear. Meanwhile, Bray has been seen as the guy to take Taker's spot as the new creepy overlord of WWE. The idea of Bray actually beating Taker was one that actually seemed possible, but unfortunately for Bray, this would mark another huge loss for his career. Like with Cena the year prior, Bray lost his WrestleMania match with The Undertaker in another one of those moments that, in hindsight, really hurt the character of Bray. Sure, you could argue that Taker needed the victory to regain his aura that he lost the year prior, but this was a moment that could have made Bray Wyatt's whole career. Instead, Bray was just fed to The Undertaker and the whole thing was quickly forgotten about as Bray would take on Ryback the following month. And this moment was really the thing that sparked the first real feeling of fan disinterest in Bray Wyatt. While many people look at Bray's loss to Cena as the defining loss of his career, it's easy to see that that one isolated loss was not the issue. It was the fact that Bray, after being the biggest name in the company, never got back to feeling anywhere near as big as he could have been. Combine that with the odd booking of him getting rid of the Wyatt family and his disappointing feuds with Ambrose and The Undertaker, you can see that Bray didn't have a sudden death at the hands of John Cena. No, he slowly bled out over the course of the year and never really got back to those heights until much later in his career. And we continue to see this happen over the next few years. Following his victory over Ryback at Payback, Bray would target Roman Reigns after losing him on Raw a few weeks prior. And after costing Roman a chance at becoming Mr. Money in the Bank, the two Two would look to blow off their feud at Battleground. However, in many's delight, Bray was able to steal the victory from Roman with the help of Luke Harper. Here, Harper would realign himself with Bray as the Wyatt family would actually reform. Unfortunately though, the group wouldn't have Eric Rowan just yet as Rowan was out with an injury. But that's okay because Bray would soon find another disciple in the form of Braun Strowman. Following a loss to Roman and Dean at SummerSlam, Bray Wyatt would introduce the gigantic Strowman into the group as he completely leveled the two top babies faces, and the new group of Harper, Wyatt, and Strowman would continue to dominate the competition as they defeated the team of Roman, Dean, and Chris Jericho at Night of Champions. And with the Wyatt family standing on top of the world as the most destructive faction on Raw, the group would only grow again as Rowan made his return to rejoin the group. But perhaps Bray had relied a bit too much on his ever-growing list of allies as he would eventually lose to Roman Reigns in a Hell in a Cell match at the show with the same name. However, Bray Bray wasn't going to leave Hell in a Cell without some blood on his hands. Following the main event bout between Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker, the Wyatt family attacked the dead man. That is, before carrying The Undertaker to the back as the show came to an end, with the Wyatt family making their mark on the event. The following night on Raw, Kane confronted Wyatt in defense of his brother. However, like with Taker, Kane was attacked by the Wyatt family and carried to the back once again. This all led to a huge match at Survivor Series, where the reformed Brothers of Destruction defeated Luke Harper and Bray Wyatt with Taker finally putting an end to his feud with Bray. However, despite losing to Kane and Taker, the Wyatt family would get another chance to showcase their power as they defeated a group of ECW legends in an eight-man elimination tag team tables match. The following month, however, Bray would find a new target in the Royal Rumble match. During the match, the Wyatt family were all eliminated by Brock Lesnar before they all returned the favor by running back into the ring and eliminating Lesnar himself. This would set up a match between Brock and the duo of Bray and Harper at Roe block, which Brock won to hype him up for his match at WrestleMania with Dean Ambrose. Yes, even the thought of Brock and Bray having a singles match at WrestleMania is mouthwatering. The company decided to push Brock into a rather disappointing match with Dean at the show. However, that doesn't mean that Bray had nothing to do with WrestleMania 32. At the show, Bray went one-on-one -on -one with The Rock. Wait, I'm uh, sorry. That, what I mean is The Rock went one-on-one -on -one with Eric Rowan. You see, The Rock came out in front of a sold-out arena before being interrupted by Bray, Rowan, and Strowman. This then led to a match between The Rock and Eric Rowan, 
which The Rock won in six seconds. But when Bray went to attack The Rock following the impromptu match, John Cena made a shocking return to help The Rock fight off the Wyatt family. For months by this point, the Wyatt family were just losing over and over again to the biggest stars in the company. They seemingly had nowhere to go from here, with them starting a feud with the League of Nations after WrestleMania, but we wouldn't get to see these two factions battle it out, thankfully, as Bray suffered an injury just two weeks after WrestleMania. This injury was perhaps a blessing in disguise for Bray then, as he got to leave for a little bit and help freshen up the character before returning soon to kick off a feud with The New Day. The New Day by this point were rapidly growing in popularity as a top babyface tag team. They had become tag team champions by this point, but the feud was m about more than just the titles. It was like seeing two polar opposites battle with the happy-go-lucky New Day taking on the dark and menacing Wyatt family. They even waged war at the Wyatt compound in the build-up to a six-man tag team match at Battleground, which the Wyatts won in a decisive fashion. But this group would unfortunately be forced to split apart through the draft as Braun Strowman would head to Raw with Wyatt and Rowan going to the blue brand. But Bray took this opportunity as a way to not only freshen up his character, but also his faction as he targeted Randy Orton. And over the next few months, Wyatt would feud with the Viper as he looked to fix the damaged Orton, kind of like he did with Daniel Bryan a couple years prior. Until finally, on a late October episode of SmackDown, Randy would join the Wyatt family by helping Bray defeat Kane. And for the first time in a long time, Bray felt like a credible threat with the inclusion of Orton. The Wyatt family felt fresh, and Bray looked to finally have all the pieces he needed to become a top star once again. This new partnership even helped Bray capture his first taste of gold, as the two won the SmackDown tag team titles from Rhino and Heath Slater at TLC. But despite the success seen by Bray, the Wyatt family would soon lose those tag team titles of theirs when Luke Harper teamed with Randy in a fatal four-way tag team match on SmackDown. This loss sparked an inner turmoil between the family members, Harper and Rowan, who ultimately faced each other on SmackDown. It was one of the originally three members of the Wyatt family versus the new star that was taking the group to new heights. Ultimately though, despite Harper using his spotlight to impress the fans, Orton was able to catch Harper with an RKO and won the match. Following the match, Wyatt exiled Harper from the group via assist. Abigail. The tension would bleed into the Royal Rumble match as well, with Harper targeting Wyatt and Orton before being ejected from the ring. However, this match also served as another wrinkle to the Wyatt family storyline with Orton winning the Rumble match after making it to the final three alongside Bray. But who would Randy be fighting at WrestleMania? Well, we would get that answer at the upcoming Elimination Chamber event. During the match that debuted the modern day version of the structure, several stars competed to see who would be walking into WrestleMania as WWE Champion, and for the first time in his career, Bray Wyatt was able to win the match and capture the WWE Championship. However, in the lead up to Mania, Randy continuously denied his intentions of facing Bray for the title. But of course, this was all a ruse as the Viper showed his snake-like tendencies by betraying Bray and burning down the Wyatt family compound alongside the grave of Sister Abigail. This was such an intense build. Everyone was on the edge of their seats. WrestleMania 33 was upon us and hopes were high for the match between Bray and Orton. But now we get to yet another their pitfall for Bray. Not only did Bray lose his championship to Orton, a guy who certainly did not need the title at this point, but he also lost it in such a terrible way. You see, WWE's creative team has had a poor track record when it came to handling characters like Bray. Everything Bray seems to bring to the table, the aura, the mystique, the intensity, that stuff is great. But then, WWE decides to treat him as a spooky character with all these weird gimmicks They make him feel like a cheesy horror movie villain rather than an actually intimidating figure. And at WrestleMania 33, we saw this during their match as Bray would summon these pretty underwhelming projections of maggots and worms onto the ring canvas. At least the Boogeyman had live worms, but either way, the creepy crawlies in Bray's projections couldn't help him escape WrestleMania with a WWE Championship. And following Bray's move over to Raw in that year's superstar shakeup, there was still some unfinished business between himself and Randy, so they finally put their feud at rest at Payback in a House of Horrors match. And like with the projections at WrestleMania, this match only worsened Bray's reputation with the cheesy horror tropes all over the match. A haunted tractor, a spooky fridge, and hanging baby dolls all reminded fans that Bray was nothing more than just another WWE spooky character that honestly just seemed like a joke and we shouldn't take seriously. And the year following this feud only continues to dampen Bray's status in the 
the company. Throughout the entire year, Bray was handed huge losses over and over again. At Extreme Rules, Bray lost in a number one contenders match for the Universal title, and sure, while he beat Seth Rollins at Great Balls of Fire, he then would go on to lose to Finn Balor at back-to-back pay-per-views. Thankfully though, their final rematch at TLC had been cancelled. But why were the fans relieved by this? Well, in the build-up to the event, Bray was targeting Finn's demons and had decided to bring an alternate persona of his own. WWE, not learning the valuable lessons taught to them at WrestleMania and Payback, went back to the cheesy horror tropes, and in their infinite wisdom, Bray was forced to dress up as Sister Abigail in perhaps the worst segment in Bray's entire run this fall. He was pulled from the match at TLC, however, due to illness, and Wyatt would return a month later, losing to Jason Jordan on Raw. But there looked to be a little bit of upside for Bray. You see, around this time, Matt Hardy had completed his transformation into becoming Woken Matt. A character originally created in Impact Wrestling, Matt would spew these bizarre promos and have such elaborate storylines that produced some of the most insane moments in Matt's entire career. It was all such an odd character for Matt, which is what made fans believe that a feud between Matt and Bray could be rather intriguing. But then when we actually got the feud, it was perhaps a bit too normal for many fans liking. A feud that could end up as this epic goth saga turned out to just consist of the two cutting cryptic promos on each other over and over again. For a feud featuring two over-the-top characters like this, you'd think that the segments featuring them would be more memorable. Either way, the two did end up competing multiple times over with the most notable battle taking place at the Hardy compound in an ultimate deletion match. This match was really the only time we as fans got to see the magical mind of Matt Hardy take over WWE programming. Really, the first example of a cinematic match in WWE, the two men went through everything, from having fireworks blow up at ringside, to seeing Matt almost run over Bray with a lawnmower, to even literal teleportation around a graveyard. This match was easily one of the most unique fights in WWE history, and it concluded with Matt throwing Bray into the lake of reincarnation, writing him off for a little while. And in an interesting twist, Bray's return actually saw himself aligned with Matt at WrestleMania 34, helping Matt win the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. He turned into a babyface for really the first time in his career, and the two would become the deleters of worlds. However, after a short tag title run, Matt and Bray would quietly disband and they would disappear off screen for quite some time. You see, when Bray left our screens, he did so with a purpose. As I stated earlier, Bray is one of the most creative wrestlers in the world with the ability to create these extremely over-the-top characters. And when Bray left, he was out creating something that many fans would describe as his masterpiece. He would create the Firefly Funhouse. In April 2019, Bray would return to our screens playing the role of a children's TV host alongside several puppet characters, all casted as members of the Funhouse. Mercy the Buzzard, Abby the Witch, Ramblin' Rabbit, and Huskus the Pig Boy all joined Bray in the Funhouse as the WWE fans were instantly hooked. A show full of niche references and a dark undertone, the WWE Universe latched onto the show and Bray became the most popular act in pro wrestling seemingly overnight. And then at SummerSlam, Bray's new character would finally be put to the test as he had his first match under the new persona. But what we saw was something a lot darker than what was originally promised with the Firefly life on house. While Bray for the most part acted as a children's TV host, Bray would choose to let out his personal demons in the ring with the Fiend leaving bodies in his wake. At SummerSlam, the Fiend debuted and immediately left fans in awe with an eerie entrance and a violent squash victory over Finn Balor a victory that made Balor flee down to NXT and completely reinvent himself to shake off the loss. But what do you do with the hottest act on your roster? Well, if you're WWE, then you know exactly what to do. You kill all his momentum. Yep. After an entire career of creative suffering, Bray finally reinvented himself to become literally the most over character in WWE, and WWE responded to this by doing everything they could to kill his momentum. At Hell in a Cell, Bray challenged Universal Champion Seth Rollins to a match in the structure, a structure that has left people broken, shattered, and changed forever. The same structure that Mick Foley nearly killed himself in time and time again. And what happened? Well, the referee stopped the match due to the violence of Seth using a giant cartoon hammer on The Fiend. Perhaps the worst main event in WWE history, The Fiend's momentum was destroyed following this match and never really recovered. But at Crown Jewel, 
WWE corrected that mistake, kinda, by having The Fiend finally beat Rollins to win the title. But then we get to yet another fundamental disconnect between Bray and the WWE creative team. You see, The Fiend was a slasher movie character, the new Jason of WWE. But if he has the top title in WWE, then it's going to be really hard to create any interesting character based stories since it's all going to be framed around the championship rather than anything involving the character specifically. For example, while The Fiend could have targeted anyone he has a past relationship with, like Eric Rowan, Matt Hardy, or Randy Orton, Bray's title run would see him feud with guys like The Miz and Goldberg. Sure, Bray got to have that character based storyline with Daniel Bryan, with the two even competing in The Fiend's best in ring match at the Royal Rumble, but it was all still framed mainly around the title rather than their past relationship that could have been used to tell a more compelling story. Like, the reason why Bray first targeted Finn is because they have some history together. The Miz has never really interacted with Bray before. So the solution was simple, get the title off Bray. But of course, WWE also had to fumble that one as well with Bray being fed to Goldberg in a squash match at Super Showdown. Yes, the 53 year old that could hardly move could barely even pick up Bray to hit the jackhammer at Goldberg. Bray's character seemed destroyed. His credibility as a killer in WWE had completely tarnished. All hope was seemingly lost and Bray just had one last chance to light a spark back into the Fiend character character, but Bray is like a cockroach in that respect. You can never fully kill fan interest in Bray, and Bray always has something up his sleeve, and at WrestleMania 36, we watched as Bray took on John Cena in a Firefly Funhouse match, and this match completely revolutionized the industry in my opinion. Bray's full creativity was on display here, with Cena's entire history being played out and manipulated by Bray. Bray didn't just beat Cena here, he did it in one of the most compelling ways in history, using pro wrestling history to defeat his opponent while creating a spectacle in the process. Bray in this one match was able to completely turn the WWE Universe on its head and all of that momentum that he lost at Super Showdown was instantly taken back by Bray. And he used this momentum to launch into a feud with the new Universal Champion, Braun Strowman. At Money in the Bank, however, Bray lost to Strowman, not as the Fiend, but rather the Firefly Funhouse version of himself. And at the horror show at Extreme Rules though, Bray would get his non-title rematch in another cinematic match called the Wyatt Swamp Fight. This match, while not feeling nearly as special as Wyatt's previous cinematic matches, ended with The Fiend emerging from the swamp and being let loose once again. The Fiend would continue to haunt Strowman, adding Alexa Bliss to his list of targets. You see, Bliss and Strowman had been established by this point as being at least friendly towards one another, and Bray fully recognized that. This would culminate in a match between Strowman and The Fiend at SummerSlam, where The Fiend would beat the monster among men to recapture the Universal Championship, but after the match, Match, everyone was left in shock as Roman Reigns made his return to turn heel and attack both men. And at payback the following month, The Fiend defended his title against Strowman and Reigns in a triple threat match, which he lost after Reigns pinned Strowman to win the title and start his journey towards becoming the tribal chief. And so Bray disappeared for about a month following this loss, returning and immediately aligning himself with Alexa Bliss. Yes, in another shocking twist, Bliss and Bray would become partners as Bliss would transform into this eerie alternate version of herself, acting almost like a Harley Quinn to Bray's Joker, and the duo would start to run rampant around WWE before finally coming face to face with Bray's old rival, Randy Orton. The two longtime rivals would compete at TLC in a Firefly Inferno match, which Randy won by setting Bray on fire and leaving him as a charred corpse to disappear back into the unknown. Bray was gone for months after this match, with the feud continuing between Orton and Bliss. At Fastlane a few months later, Orton and Bliss would look to settle things in an intergender match where Bray finally made his return, helping Bliss secure the victory. Here we saw just how damaged the Fiend was as he was completely scarred from head to toe with burn marks. And at WrestleMania 38, the two men would finally look to blow off their feud, Orton looking to get rid of the Fiend once and for all, and Bray looking to put Orton to rest permanently. The Fiend's first match since TLC saw him return with a new mask similar to the old one and a thirst for blood once again. But the Fiend's return was overshadowed by Alexa Bliss who distracted Bray with a creepy black liquid that had protruded from her mouth, and this gave Orton enough time to hit the RKO and defeat Bray at WrestleMania once again. And while fans were both disappointed and curious about Bray's future following this match, Bray would be ultimately 
released from WWE following WrestleMania. And for a little over a year, fans thought that that would be the end of Bray's time in WWE. After all, we couldn't really blame him if he wanted out of the company for good. Time and time again, he proved just how valuable he could be, and time and time again, WWE wasted his time and potential. But in September 2022, the fans were let down a rabbit hole with a series of QR codes hidden throughout the show. When scanned, fans were treated to a bunch of cryptic messages all hinting towards something big happening at Extreme Rules. And at the end of the show, fans bore witness to an epic return of Bray Wyatt, the entire arena screaming approval for Bray as they recognized him as the wrestling savant that he is. On SmackDown, Wyatt addressed the crowd and thanked them for their support until he was interrupted by a video of a new masked character dubbing himself Uncle Howdy. Fans were left intrigued and curious about this new character, and to this point, we are still left asking ourselves who Uncle Howdy really is. Nonetheless though, Bray and Howdy started targeting a new member of the WWE roster in LA Knight. And at the Royal Rumble event, the two would finally square off in the sponsored Mountain Dew Pitch Black match. And I know this match gets a lot of hate, um, I wasn't the biggest fan of it, but I was there in the arena that night and it was kinda cool, I'm not gonna lie. Bray got the victory over Knight here before Uncle Howdy appeared and dove onto Knight from an elevated platform. An explosion took place on Impact with a feud between Knight and Wild coming to an end and despite a few appearances following the match and kind of like the start of a feud between Bray and Bobby Lashley, Bray and Uncle Howdy have just randomly disappeared from our screens and we haven't seen them since. When looking back at Bray's career, it's easy to be left feeling frustrated. We hear all the time about WWE superstars needing to stand out and grab that elusive brass ring and it feels like Bray has done that multiple times. When he first arrived as the cult leader character, Bray left an impact that rocked the WWE to its core. Same thing for his reintroduction as The Fiend. And yet, through the failure of WWE's creative team, Bray's potential spot as this generation's Undertaker has been stripped away from him. Bray has one of the most creative minds in WWE today, and when put on display, Bray has produced some of the most exciting moments in WWE history. But after drawing in that excitement, Bray is forced to watch the creative team destroy his masterpieces over and over again. It honestly feels like somebody taking a knife and cutting up the Mona Lisa. Bray is one of the most creative, interesting, and exciting superstars in WWE today, and when given the green light, he's able to put on some amazing performances. So let's hope that Bray is given that green light again someday. If he fails, it's understandable, but if he succeeds, well then the WWE will be completely turned upside down in the best ways possible. Thank you so much for watching, and make sure to subscribe to not miss the next video.